Get to Old Navy right now. All jeans are on sale up to 50% off. From just 15 bucks for adults, 10 bucks for kids. Try on a pair in store and save even more. With 5 bucks off your purchase of $50 or more during Old Navy's Great Denim try on thon Hurry in now to find your perfect fit and save big with up to 50% off all jeans. Now at Old Navy. Valid 812 to 821. Excludes in-store clearance, gift cards, register lane items, and jewelry. $5 discount valid with jeans purchase. Welcome to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, episode number 51. Being a writer is a very peculiar job. It's always you versus a blank screen. And quite often, the blank screen wins. Neil Gaiman. Broadcasting from a dark, windowless room in Hollywood, when we really should be working on that next draft. It's the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast. Showing you the craft and business of screenwriting while teaching you how to make your screenplay bulletproof. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast. I am your humble, humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Bulletproof Script Coverage. Now, unlike other script coverage services, Bulletproof Script Coverage actually focuses on the kind of project you are and the goals of the project you are. So we actually break it down by three categories, micro-budget, indie film market, and studio film. There's no reason to get coverage from a reader that's used to reading tentpole movies when your movie's going to be done for $100,000. And we wanted to focus on that at Bulletproof Script Coverage. Our readers have worked with Marvel Studios, CAA, WME, NBC, HBO, Disney, Scott Free, Warner Brothers, The Blacklist, and many, many more. So if you need your screenplay or TV script covered by professional readers, Head on over to CoverMyScreenplay.com. Today's show is also sponsored by TalNexus' Screenplay Competition. Now, TalNexus is looking for three categories, feature films, short films, and TV pilot. The winning feature film writer will be awarded $2,500 as a stipend and will be paired with an industry veteran screenwriter for 12 weeks to write full series pitches and pilot scripts. Winning short films and TV series pilots will receive an automatic invite to the TalNexus Film Lab, a $10,000 budget towards the production of your short film or series and a $2,500 stipend for 12 weeks in addition to being paired up with an industry mentor to help you guide and develop your project. Are you interested? Apply now. Applications close August 31st. Go to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash TalNexus. That's IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash T-A-L-N-E-X-U-S. Now, before we get started, guys, I wanted to let you know that I'm going to be doing a talk, uh, two talks, actually, at the Holly Shorts Film Festival in Hollywood at the Chinese Theater this Friday, starting at 4.30 and then another one at 6. The one at 4.30 will be discussing being a film entrepreneur. So for all you screenwriters out there who want to start developing and putting your screenplays on the screen and actually producing your own work, this might be a really good workshop for you to attend. And the second one is going to be how to build an audience with my brother from another mother, R.B. Botto from Stage 32. And that's going to be at six o'clock. I will also have books uh, there. I'll be signing books and selling books of Shooting for the Mob as well. So if you want to go, just head over to hollyshorts.com and you can check out the panels and the, the schedule there or just go to the show notes And I will leave all the information for tickets there. Now, today on the show, I have a special, special treat. We have Pilar Alessandra, who happens to be one of the industry's leading script writing consultants. She's an author. She's an uh, ex-executive in the business. And she's been also running an amazing screenwriting podcast called On the Page. She's an actual OG, original gangster for podcasting screenwriting. She has, I don't know, probably 600 or something episodes at this point. She has been helping screenwriters for many, many years. And I've been trying to get her on the show for a while, but she's a very, very busy lady. And we finally got to sit down and talk shop. Her book is called The Coffee Break Screenwriter, which is now in its second edition. And she also has a brand new book called The Coffee Break Screenwriter Breaks the Rules. And in this conversation, we just go deep into the craft of screenwriting. We go into her coffee break screenwriter uh, method, how you're able to write screen screenplays very quickly. You know, she's just a wonderful, wonderful 
uh, analyst and consultant when it comes to, to story structure and character. And we get into all of that. So sit back and enjoy my conversation with Pilar Alessandra. I'd like to welcome to the show Pilar Alessandra. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. We have been going back and forth for months because you are a busy lady and I'm a busy guy. So it's amazing yeah. that we've been able to do this. <laughs> I know. I know. Thank you for your patience. Oh, no. Thank you for being on the show. I really appreciate it. I, like I was saying uh, before we started recording, we, I reached out to you back when I was a young screenwriter looking for some advice in 2010 on my first, I think it was my first screenplay. And uh, we went back and forth a little bit, but it never, anything, nothing materialized about it. But I've known about you for a long, long time. And you do some really great work out there for screenwriters. So thank you for all the work that you do. Thank you. And I, I love it. It's great work. And you are one of the uh, original podcasts out there. I, I sound so old. All this is making me. Feel I didn't want to. I didn't want to say OG, but <laughs> since you <laughs> throw it out there, you know you're one of the OGs of <laughs> of the podcasting screenwriting world up there with John August. And because uh, you've been what ten years, you were doing your on the page podcast. Yeah, you know I didn't even realize. I mean, at the time, I was too lazy to blog, and so I was like. <laughs> I'll do this. And um, yeah, I guess I, it, there just weren't that many screenwriting podcasts at the time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, mm -hmm. and so it caught on. And when I realized that people were actually listening, I was like, Ooh, I have a responsibility here. I better start making it good. I better start making it about something. And, uh, and, and, you know, since then, yeah, I, I take the responsibility pretty seriously. Even the show can, the, the show can be bumpy and silly, but the, the whole point of it every week is that somebody should leave with a nugget of information about the craft or business of screenwriting. So that's I, what we do. I know the feeling when I first started out too, I just like, ah, you know, and then when people started listening, you start taking it serious. Like, Oh crap. Oh crap. Someone's listening to this. We got to, no, what's happening. Yes. We got to, we got to bring our a game. Right. Um, so let's, let's start at the very beginning. How did you get into this business? Um, I was, you know, I was just in my twenties and I sort of accidentally fell into a script reading job because I liked writing analytical papers in college about books. And somebody remembered that they're like, wow, in your lit, in the lit classes, you wrote these really great papers. That's kind of what we need. We need this book report called a coverage at our, our studio or our production company. Would you do it like once a week? And then when I found out I could actually make money at it, because I had no idea, right. I had samples and I was able to get a job through Amblin Entertainment that way as a script reader and learn on the job as a reader. And then um, ended up sort of teaching people how to be a script reader as well. They were getting jobs. And then I found I really loved teaching and I wanted to find tools that that actually could fix certain things that I was seeing sort of, sort of common mistakes, if you will, in scripts and I, I hated just saying pass or consider. And I thought, well, could I develop some tools? Would they work? And they did work. And, uh, and so that's how the classes were born. Very cool. And you also worked at DreamWorks for a little bit. Right. So when Amblin uh, became DreamWorks, so to speak, it was kind of you know, for a while. It yeah. was all the, uh, yes. Then it I was a hodgepodge of stuff. Right. I'd been at Amblin for a while. And so I became sort of a, in a senior story analyst position mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. I was also doing notes on existing projects. Um, I also worked for a, a number of other companies as well. Mm -hmm. Um, always analyzing material, doing notes on material. Um, but I found working directly with writers is more satisfying because I could say, and here's a possibility of fixing it rather than always saying, you know, pass or consider that's no fun. And when you were working at DreamWorks, you were working at a time that was pretty cool. It was early 2000s. So they were at the height of their powers, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah, it was actually, again, cause let's just, let's just go with aging me with every question. <laughs> um, it was actually more in the nineties. Okay. I'm trying to help. I'm trying yeah. to help. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. But it, it was, you know, like sort of the, the, it, it was the age of the rock star writer yeah, where Shane Black, Joe Astor House, those guys. Yeah. And the, the idea that you would get a script at 
even as late as 9 p.m., have to make sure that coverage was in by 7 a.m. because there'd be a bidding war at 8 a.m. I mean, people were throwing so much money in to get the next big shiny thing, um, which also is why they burnt out a little bit, you know, and started sort of holding back and saying, okay, we're not taking any more specs. And when the writer strike happened, when they had sort of an excuse to stop taking original material for quite a while. Um, but yes, at the time, lots of scripts, lots of excitement and lots of learning for me. Yeah, it must have been a, a wonderful time. I always tell people about that time, which I wasn't around, but I did study that. I mean, I was around, of course. You weren't born, right? No, yeah, I'm I'm 22. I'm 22. Right. Yes, I, I'm just worn really hard. Um, but uh, no, but uh, I wasn't in the business at that time. I was in college in those type of areas. But you would read these stories of like every week, Joe Estherhouse, two or three million dollars, Shane Black, and you know, all these rock star screenwriters. Yeah. And, I, and I feel sometimes when I speak to, to, I speak to screenwriters, they think that that's still going on. And to a certain extent, there are million dollar buys still. And there's still, there are some spec stuff that happens every once in a while, but it's nothing like it was like every week, every right. day, there was some new stuff coming out. And these guys were making just, I mean, Esther House, I think, what did Esther, I think Esther House pulled like 20, $25 million. And uh, most of them were never produced. That was the thing. Right. Was, you could actually make, you know, sort of a sweet, living and never have been produced. You know, there were a lot of people who got development deals and got, you know, their scripts bought. And, but also, you know, along those lines, they would take things on pitch a lot and then they'd have to hire another writer because the the draft that they got was only eh. So half of my job at that time was reading writing samples to rewrite other things that they had bought on pitch or too quickly. So now they're sort of doubling what they have to pay even in the development process. But again, for me to sort of distinguish between like, okay, what is uh, a project that really, really works, you know, in terms of idea and another project that works in terms of execution. So you can have a write a great writing sample as well. And, and that all helps in the work that I do now. So what is the biggest mistake do you see in first time screenplays? Oh, I don't think there is one <laughs> biggest mistake. I mean, it used to be overwriting. You know, I could, I could have sort of an easy answer to that question, mm-hmm. but now, you know, gosh, there's so many resources out there. Uh, writers are so savvy. They're so well read and they understand, you know, uh, sort of how to be spare on the page. Mm-hmm. So that's, not really it. Um, I think it's maybe sometimes not doubling down on their own good idea that they'll start something with a high concept and then they'll think it's boring. So then they start to sort of snowball into another high concept or they'll bring in this magical character here and then suddenly we're in a dream and backstory. And they just kind of think that by throwing in all these things, it gets more interesting when actually it's getting more convoluted and you're not serving your own good idea. So I'd really like people when they, when they just lean in to their own wonderful log line mm-hmm. and that's the best rewrite they can do. So in your opinion, what is a screenplay that you've read that is just like, oh man, this, they got this. Like it's, this is, if everybody should read the screenplay and use this as a, as a template of what to do, uh, and how they did it. Of course not copy the screenplay, but just like, man, that's just good writing. You know, I, I, first of all, you're probably not going to believe me, but I'm always the most in love with whatever client's work I read that just worked. You know what I mean? I'm always like that script, that script. So I don't really have one script that I tell everybody to read, but I do say that, you know, in the, in the age where you can just type in the script title and then script PDF and something will magically illegally download for you, you know, (laughs) you can go to like your favorite movies and then go to the section of the script where that favorite moment was in that favorite movie and look at how it was executed. Like how did they make you feel that way? Whether it was feeling romantic or surprised or horrified. And to me, that's the best thing you can do with scripts is find those moments in those great scripts with movies you love. So I'm kind of throwing it back, not going like there's this one script because I think every script has, has its its moment. 
is. Yeah, yeah. Every every scripts work. You know, oh, I love this part of it, but it also there are, there are dead moments in every great script. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You don't want to copy everything that your favorite writer does. Well, Average writer does is not perfect. It's like like in a John Ford film, uh, the, the Indians take the fort, like that. You know, that's one line, but it took twenty minutes on screen. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, now, what uh, what is your approach to structure? Do you do you uh, suggest creating a beat sheet of some sort, or how do you like do structure? Well, the, in my classes, um, I do have them everybody create a beat sheet, but not to beats that I think they should have. So I'm not sitting there going on page 12, there needs to be this. And on page mm-hmm. 20, there needs to be that. Um, instead, I first ask them to think big picture in terms of beginning, middle and end. And we usually take that middle and divide it into two parts. So we've got beginning, middle part one, middle part two and end. So you sort of have four equal parts that you can play with. And then I ask them to divide those up a little bit into beats of story. And I just ask them to think of every beat in terms of what somebody wants to do, what they actually do, and what gets in the way. And if you have those beats of story with, you know, sort of fitting into those four equal parts, great, look, you got a structure. What story you want to tell or how you want to tell it is completely up to you. But it helps people at least organize so that they can see the big picture, have some kind of map to follow, and then start start writing. Now, character building. Mm-hmm. It's is always a very difficult situation. What what do you how do you build an interesting character in your opinion? What are some what's some advice that you can give for screenwriters to build interesting characters? Because I've read a lot of screenplays and I've watched a lot of movies and the characters are just like there's no depth, there's no especially in the st- uh, big studio movies too. Um I always beat up on the DC universe, but uh, you know, there's a reason why Marvel's done very well and DC has not, because the characters you you really feel Iron Man, you really feel Spider Man. And you don't feel as much for the other side of the fence sometimes. Well, I think I think if you look at the Marvel characters, they're always paying off their own particular character rules. So things that they always or never do, you know, you know Tony Stark's philosophy of the world. You know his flaw in the fact that he is always going to sort of try and grab the attention of the room, right? He's always going to try and alpha lead, right? Mm -hmm. Um, You know what his soft spot is. And they're constantly mining these things we already know about them and bringing them through the scenes. So he doesn't stop and talk about his past. Instead, his past is always shining through in the choices that he makes. So when going back to my classes, when we're talking about character development, I really love it when we are learning about characters on the job, who, how they were raised, who they are comes through in the choices they make and the behaviors that they exhibit. So it's what we see rather than what they stop and talk about. I am not a big one on stopping and discussing things that happened before page one. You mean, so, oh, so, so you mean so you basically you shouldn't have two characters go, hey Tony, I know that you had a bad childhood and that's why you're an alcoholic now. Like that's not what you do, and that's but a lot of screenwriters do that, unfortunately. I read it all the time, I read it all the time. There's always that you know stop and talk scene, you know, and it also becomes <laughs> sort of a battle of backstory. Like you think you had a bad childhood, you know. <laughs> You know, it's like, it's just, why, why are you doing that? You know, but if I saw someone, um, you know, look at an object and start shaking, Mm -hmm. okay, I know that there is some kind of traumatic incident connected with that object or that that object triggers something from the past. And I will find out more with the, with the choices that character makes. And if at a certain point they've earned their cathartic moment of revealing the backstory, fine. You know, but at least you've shown it for a while. And now I'm getting just what I need to sort of fill in the blanks. It's kind of like Indiana Jones where he, he's afraid of snakes. And he, didn't, he just never says – I mean he does say he's afraid of snakes. But you never know why until the third movie where he actually explains the backstory of it, which is such a great payoff for that character. And yeah. even, that, even that little cut that Harrison Ford has is when he was a kid and he whipped – he tried to do the whip for the first time and he's hit himself. Like those little nuggets are so – it just adds like a tapestry, if you will, on the characters. But all we cared about in the first one was – 
wow, this guy who isn't afraid of anything is afraid of this one thing. We all have fears and that's all we had to know. And then once that's in, we can also see it pay off, you know, in a pit full of snakes. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it works there, you know, you're right. As you build up, build out these trilogies, then you can find out more and more. And it's, it's what keeps us coming back to the movies. And that's why the, the, the payoff, I mean, uh, with Endgame, as of this recording, Endgame came out a few weeks ago, and it is just a crescendo of 22 films. It's, it's, no one's ever done anything like this. And, and again, I'm not a, I'm, I am a Marvel guy, but I'm not like, oh, everything's great. They have bad movies. But this was such a wonderful way of just wrapping it up and, the, and payoffs of the characters over 20, over 10 years. Yeah. It is amazing. I mean, when you, I mean, I'm sure you've been watching these stories as they've, you know, come out over the years and to see this kind of crescendo of, of these characters, it's just, just nothing like it. I've never seen. It was so great. And you're just sitting there going, you know, that, that last moment of like, mm-hmm. say it, say it, you know, like, <laughs> And, you know, and to be honest with you, there were moments in that battle when I thought, oh, that's a great way to end it. And then, right. I, and then I like they would bring in this other thing like, oh, no, no, that's the great way. To, oh, of course they have to, you know, they, they finished off everything with still leaving room for whatever they're going to do with the next series of Marvel movies, Spider-Man, et cetera. What I find... No, no worries. It's okay. Um, what I what I found also fascinating, and I heard this from uh, the directors and the writers, is that they actually, when they got to the battle scene of Endgame, that was going to be a three act structure of that literally of the battle. It was such a ma- it was like forty five minutes, so it was such a massive part. They were going to do a three act structure of the battle itself within uh-huh. a giant or structure because it was just so. I mean, I can't, the, the screenwriters for that film and the directors how they were able to work in so many storylines, so many characters, so many like giving everybody, because every single one of them literally is the star of their own franchise. Right, and right. yet they're giving everyone that moment. They're giving Miss Marvel the moment. They're giving the Spider-Man that moment. They're giving Iron Man and Thor and all. How do you, like with, with people who are writing very, you know, a lot of characters in a screenplay, and I know that there's not many films like Endgame, but out there that have a lot of different characters that have like, like let's say a Suicide Squad or a Guardians of the Galaxy, that have a, a group of characters. Any advice on how to balance that? Because that is an art in itself. Well, I think first of all, step back, think big picture in terms of your, your major act breaks so that you know mm-hmm. at least where this is all landing, okay? Mm-hmm. And again, when we're talking about act breaks, it doesn't have to be prescribed. This must happen at this point, right? But if you imagine that you have at least three turning points in a project, okay, um, you know, what leads into that second act and what feels like that midpoint and what's the end of that second act before you're really going for it in the third act, just knowing those things, okay, that first. Mm-hmm. Then look at your ensemble of characters, you know what it's driving toward, but they're all having sort of their mini stories along the way. See if you can now tell what, tell each of those stories in three to four scenes. So again, thinking like what's the, that beginning, that middle part one, middle part two, Mm -hmm. and end just for that character. Okay. Because sometimes when it's heavy, heavily populated, that's all you're, you're going to get. Or even look into your favorite ensemble movies and, you know, pluck out one character and just think about the scenes that you're seeing them in. You're going to see it's really not that many. Mm -hmm. So how are they telling that one story and how do they sort of jump in so that you're focusing on that major story beat, even though it's only a scene? So I think that that would be my advice. I hope that makes sense. It makes perfect sense. Makes perfect sense. Now, do you have any advice on how to find the voice of a character? Because so many characters are so vanilla and they just, they just don't have any flavor to them. Like, you know, let's bring back Indiana Jones. Boy, that man has a lot of flavor and you pick it, that character. And within the first five minutes of the movie, you know, you know who that character is. And then you start developing the, the voice of that character. And like you were saying with like Tony Stark and these other characters that, there's rules within what they do and their actions that they stay true to. What do you do to find the voice of a character? Well, I have a couple of tips that I, I sort of have my care, my, my writers run through in class. Um, number one is what profession or stage of life 
are they in and therefore what language do they speak? So we all speak English maybe, right? But some of us speak surfer and some of us speak comic book geek and some of us speak lawyer, right? So that profession or stage of life, that becomes a language. Mm. So that's one way to find a unique voice. Um, Another is a, a verbal rule. So this is not what they say, but how they say it. So some people curse, some people give one word answers, some people ramble, right? So their verbal rules, that's another thing to think about. Um, A third is what region or country are they from? What, What phrases do they use? You know, so... Thor is going to use, you know, phrases uh, from where, where is he from? What? Um, well, he's from a magical land, but generally Norse is, is kind of like that kind of vibe. Yes. Yeah. And, and he speaks the language of the gods, right? So he will say things that nobody else would say, right? Mm-hmm. And get and, away with it and get away with it. Absolutely. But including those phrases, like that's his, his, his normal world, right? And then the fourth one is to actually magically cast in your head. Um, be okay about having the voice of Harrison Ford in your head. Okay, that will be a completely different voice on the page than, say, Chris Pratt, right? Right. So, um, so, so having it, right, will help you express the line. Nobody has to know that that's living in your head. And if you were doing a spec of a TV show, you would have the advantage of, of characters that, that we already know that you're cha- channeling. So why not do that with original material? So those are my four ways of finding voices. I, I really love the stage of life idea. That is a, re- I've never heard that, t- that, that idea. It's a really great idea because it really sets, it's you're there. You know, yeah. I'm a 45 year old comic book geek who lives in the basement of his mom's house. That pretty much gives the voice of that character pretty quickly. Now, is it a voice that we've seen a thousand times too? Yeah. That's another thing. So you could start tossing it around and start adding other things. Oh, and they're also an archaeologist. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. So they start adding like little flavors of things to, but the, but that's a good starting point of how you can kind of brainstorm uh, ideas. Have you, have you seen book smart yet? I'm dying to, I really looks fantastic. So good, right? So if you said, well, she speaks a uh, high school senior, well, we have these sort of stereotypes in our head, right? Mm-hmm. But if you say she speaks overachiever, okay, that's different. She happens to be a high school senior who speaks overachiever, right? Now she's got an interesting voice, you know? So that's interesting. That's great. Everything about that that movie, I just adored because every time you thought it was going to make a certain choice based on all these movies you've seen, it makes a, a slightly different one. Doesn't mean that it has to be the opposite, but it's just different. And it works for the character. It's in keeping with the rules of the character that we've come to know very quickly with the characters. It's 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 lovely. A good example of, of, of that is, uh, like you just said, high school is clueless. Like it's, Mm -hmm. they're not just your general, they're Valley girls, basically, you know, Mm -hmm. but Valley girls in that time period, not like Valley girl, like when Valley girl came out back in, was it like the late seventies or early eighties with Nicolas Cage, that, that was the first time anyone had ever heard Valley girl talk like, oh, Mm -hmm. for sure. And all that kind of stuff. And that was, but they were all high school kids or Fast Times in Richmond High. So how many different type of high schools have we've seen on screen? So Fast Time in Richmond High speaks very differently than Breakfast Club. Right. Right. You know, if you go even dig deeper to, you know, why did Clueless not feel cookie cutter? Mm -hmm. Right. You could go for, you know, the lead is, you know, she speaks matchmaker in a way. Right. (laughs) That that is everything. She looks at everything in terms of who to fix up, who, you know, who should be with whom. Who's the project. Right. And it speaks to her control issues. So her voice matches what she needs to do. I have to be, I have to make a confession, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm in my twenties reading and, uh, I misread that script as just another Valley girl script. And I passed on it because really? I was in my twenties and I thought these girls are dumb. They're just <laughs> Valley girls. And I really wasn't looking at, no, wait a minute. They've got their own rules. They've got their own ways yeah. of, of looking at things. I was actually probably too much of a clueless Valley girl myself at the time <laughs> to, to really have the perspective. 
It haunts me. It haunts me. Really? And it almost fired. Yeah. It almost got you. It almost got you fired because you're like you passed on the script and it made a god gazillions amounts of money. Yeah. Yeah. Idiot. Yeah, right. <laughs> but the thing is, too, it was also a lot of perfect storms in that situation with Alicia Silverstone was perfectly cast. And I was Penelope, Penelope who's it? Not Penelope Miller. Who was the director of that? Um, um, it was, oh my God, she's amazing. Be- not Beth McCall- no. Miller. We're so bad. Oh my so- God. No, it's it's a female director. Um, okay, I forgot who she is. Everyone, someone. Thanks for thanks for making me feel better. I really appreciate it. But <laughs> right. no, it, it was just me being an idiot. So, <laughs> <laughs> are there any other anything else that I passed on? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> I mean, it was a long time ago. Sure. You know. but nothing that um, stood out like that. But you know, what? one thing I I have to say, I, I do think that you know it does say something about you know getting older, or having some experience, or also you know having a bigger picture view of the world mm-hmm. that, you know, if you're just reading scripts from your own little bubble, right, you're going to miss some really valuable material. You know, and you have to sort of think like an audience for one thing, a really wide audience, and you have to kind of be open to characters and situations that may not necessarily be you or any choices you would make, you know, which is why I get like, prickly when people go into this unlikable note because it's like well that might be unlikable for you right you know perspective. but it's it's it could be fascinating for someone else you know that doesn't mean we shouldn't sort of look at this life on screen and and you know and dig into that story it was kind of like clueless for you like you knew those girls because you were probably close you you were too much of yeah. a valley girl yourself so you're like this is stupid <laughs> right i was judging them exactly and and it had nothing to do with me you know, that's fair. Uh, now, uh, now, do you have uh, any other advice on developing a good protagonist and what they need to do to kind of move that story forward? Are you, by the way, are you more character driven or plot driven or is it a combination of two? Because I know I've, I've spoken to a lot of people on the show and some people are like, it's all about character. You need a good plot. You need a good structure, but it's all about character. And other people are like, no, it's about plot. It's about structure and characters are an addition. Where do you fall on that that pendulum? I'm going to, I'm going to say something wishy-washy and say it's what the project needs. So okay. in the, in the first, in my first day of the first draft class, I have my writers brainstorm in three different ways because they may be coming at their project in three different ways and they have to see what's really going to work for them. So the first thing that we do is brainstorm around character, sort of throwing that character into uncomfortable situations and seeing what choices they make and seeing what structure emerges. Mm -hmm. The second thing I have them do is actually uh, brainstorm around event. So if they have this one key scene in their head, what happens, where is it on the timeline? Is it in the beginning, the middle, the end? And that, that way, what comes before it, what springs after it. Um, And the third way I have them brainstorm is just, okay, let's, if it's just your big high concept idea, Let's make it the most killer log line possible and see if that really helps you brainstorm. So I, I really go with what's going to serve the writer's intentions the most. I don't think there's one way to do it. Yeah, because there's certain movies like um, I was just thinking of Wayne's World. Like that's a character based kind of film. The structure is in the plots. eh. It's fine, right. but you're just going on the road with these guys who are crazy. Cheech and Chong, let's put that out there. You know, it's like well, those both came out of sketches, right? So yeah. we have these, these guys who we just laughed at the dynamic between them. You know, this one little world that they were in, and then did a lot of what ifing to find a story. So right. what right. if? You know, uh, I think Wayne and Garth. Are they trying to get to their ultimate concert? I don't, I don't even remember. I, I don't even remember what the plot is. I remember <laughs> Bohemian Rhapsody. <laughs> I, that's, I remember Bohemian Rhapsody and that he had a crush on a girl and they like, and then basically all the skit stuff. That's basically right. what I remember from the movie. Exactly. You know, <laughs> as long as they're, they have like one goal and they're making choices along the way that are specific to them, you know, great. You got, you got a film. It's like a Muppet movie. I mean, it's like you, you just all, you're hanging out with the, the Muppets and then just, they're all doing this one thing. We got to get to the show. We gotta, right. we gotta break in and, and steal that diamond. We gotta, you know, that kind of, that kind of thing. It's, it's fascinating. Now, but another, there tends to be an emotional turn somewhere in a Muppet movie at some point, right? They always so, is. 
Miss Piggy is, is going to break up with Kermit or Kermit's going to break up with Miss Piggy or there's a misunderstanding between, you know, right. yeah, I don't know. There's always something that sort of reinvests you emotionally. So even though we're saying, yeah, we take these characters, put them in goal, there's always also that sort of emotional. Even, even with the Wayne, Wayne and Garth, there was some sort of, you know, emotional thing. It doesn't make sure. you cry, but there's something. I just love that this, this, this interview went to the Muppets and now we're using the Muppets as a structural example for cats. We, we can learn many things from the Muppets. Yes. A, a, amen. Amen, sister. Uh, now, uh, antagonist, creating a good bad guy. It is so, I mean, there's such a problem. I think it's a, it's, it's an epidemic of really bad foreign bad guys in action movies. Like it's always the guy who has the accent and all this stuff. And then you, you look at some of, uh, you know, some of the greatest bad guys of all time. And I'll, I'll go just at the action genre, you know, Hans from Die Hard, who also was a foreign dude and all that stuff. It was so wonderfully written, so wonderfully directed and played. You know, and and you and you look at those like Mr. Joshua from Lethal Weapon, who is so you know amazing, and of course like Darth Vader and and those kind of characters. What do you, what are some advice do you have for creating a really great antagonist? The Joker. I just came to me of course one of the greatest. Um, what it, with with the Joker from the Dark Knight you're talking yeah. about? Mm-hmm. Um, no, the 1969 Adam West version. No, I'm joking. <laughs> You know, you never know, right? <laughs> so, uh, so if there is, um, I wish I could quote it right now, but I actually show the log line of the Joker from The Dark Knight in one of my classes because his log line is that he's somebody who is who is trying to um, bring fun back to the city and stop this horrible masked man. From uh, from ruining all of that fun, he believes what he is doing is is a good thing. You know, if he has to kill people to do it, so be it. So every bad guy has his or her own log line, and the you know my first my first piece of advice is what is their log line? What's their movie? Right. So as they're looking in on these scenes. How do they feel they're the hero? And I'm certainly not the first person to say that, Mm -hmm. Um, but it it does, it is worth it to actually go in and go, what is your antagonist's logline? They don't think they're evil. They think they're right. Right. But isn't that the truth for every bad guy in history? You know, every dictator, every mass murderer, and in one way, shape, or form, they're not there twiddling uh, or twisting their mustache they truly believe that they're doing something. If not, you couldn't really go to sleep at night. So you truly believe in a psychotic break or of some sort, obviously, that breaks from societal norms, that you're okay. doing good from your perspective. Because I always tell people, the bad guy is always the hero of his own story. Absolutely. He's not the villain, you know? Absolutely. Yes. So the writer, it's, it's like we can say this for days, but if the writer doesn't actually know what that story is, if they just go, uh-huh, uh-huh, I believe you, right? And still write them in this cookie cutter way, they haven't really gone into the, the writer's, into the bad guy's psyche. You know, why are they doing what they do? Now, that does not mean that you stop the script and you go into a flashback of what made the guy evil. That's different. That's their backstory. And we don't need it. We just right. need to know what is their point of view now in this moment. Why do they think they're right? And it will humanize them in terms of how they express their lines, um, some of the choices that they make, things like that. So um, and two great examples I was just thinking off the top of my head was um, Thanos, obviously, because it's on mind, is, you know, in his mind, he's just trying to it's the, the the universe is overpopulated and it's just there's just too many people so we're just going to get rid of half of the universe yeah. that's that's his point of view he's like i'm just i'm just trying to help and yes. then right is that basically that's basically Thanos. i think to the actor's gentle voice that he uses yeah right, right? he doesn't even though he's huge he's always kind of explaining this like he's a philosophy professor yes, right yes josh brolin yeah. yeah right and and so uh, i think it goes with again he the the point of view is very clear so the actor is able to now interpret it with more depth than than usual. Yeah, and a lot of the Marvel movies is that's one of the weaknesses of those Marvel movies is that the, the antagonist always a lot of times wasn't as 
strong as the protagonist. The protagonist was so well developed, but the antagonist weren't. Thanos is a good one, but the other one in Black in Black Panther um, mm-hmm. was wonderful because you just felt bad for him, you know, because he was so. Uh, you remember Black Pan- Black Panther? Um, uh, uh, Monger, oh, I forgot his name. Um, Warmonger. Uh, but uh, if Warmonger, I think his name was. But he was, he's basically his, he's like a stepbrother or a cousin. He's a cousin to Black Panther. And he never got raised in Wakanda. He was thrown out in the street and he was rejected. Right. And we do see a little of his backstory right. too. Tr- that triggers it. Right. Yeah. And he just wants to come back and take what's his. I mean, because it's obviously wrong what he's doing, but you get it. Like you, right. like if I was put in that position, would I make those choices? If I had that situation, you know, th- and that's what really humanizes that character. Like even the main character felt bad about r- spoiler alert when he doesn't win at the end. Um, you know, if he feels bad when he has to, you know, finish the job, if if you will, because he's like, I feel your pain, I do, and that's that was what made I think that, that that made that movie such a a hit as well as all the other cool stuff that happened in it. But without that great antagonist. I mean, what is Star Wars without Darth Vader? Like, right, right. And look at um, going to Devil Wears Prada, Miranda. Oh, so right? wonderful. So, like, you know, what's fun is how beastly she is through most of it, and then we're starting to see her point of view. And this is a, you know, a busy working mother. Like, this is <laughs> like, sorry, you know, sometimes you need to get the stuff done. Plus, she has an expertise in fashion. So when she's cutting your protagonist down to size, she's not just saying you're stupid. She's saying you don't understand the industry you're in and this is why, you know, and she's right. Yeah. So I, you can't help but go, oh, yeah, I, I wish you hadn't been so mean to the pro- protagonist, but you were right. Yeah, I absolutely. get you. Yeah. yeah. And that's what makes that movie so wonderful. I mean, Meryl Streep, of course, but, um, but that, that character was so, so wonderfully played. Uh, yeah, agreed. 110%. Um, now do you have any techniques for brainstorming tech, uh, brainstorming scenes? You know, sometimes you're like, you have a story, but like, I always find that the beginning and the end are very easy to write. It's that, <laughs> it's that middle stuff that gets a little, <laughs> a little rough, how they get to point A to point B creating those scenes in a wonder in a good way or in a entertaining way or in a way that we haven't seen a thousand times. I feel sometimes the screenwriters in the fifties and sixties and seventies had such a leg up because audiences weren't nearly as sophisticated and they and a lot of stuff hadn't been done yet. You know, nowadays, how much content are we making? How many things, how many things have we seen? I've seen tens of thousands of movies probably in my lifetime, let alone TV show episodes and stuff. So I'm extremely literate. You're extremely literate on, like, my wife is even going, oh, the, st- uh, the storyline on that one didn't work. The character arc didn't work. Like, she's even pointing out green screen, bad green screen shots now, and she's not in the business. Uh, yeah. So we're so sophisticated. What do you do about coming up with some original ideas, and what kind of brainstorming techniques do you suggest? Well, in a way, you know, you can flip what you just said and make it an advantage for the modern-day screenwriter because the audience does have so much context now. Right. That you can drop into a scene at a specific point without setup because mm-hmm. the, the audience already knows the journey that led there because we've seen other versions of this story in other movies. Mm-hmm. So that's the first thing I would say is drop in. OK, maybe drop in at the, the least handholding part and see what it looks like. Okay. Another is if you do that, does that work within the context of the movie in terms of something that you set up earlier on? Um, another is having a fresh take on an old trope. So it's absolutely fine to have tropes that we, I mean, look with genres. Well, scream, uh, like scream, for example. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, that was very self-aware and sort of calling it out. But like, if you look at, um, I always use an interrogation scene as an example because immediately you know what that looks like, right? In light head. bulb, light bulbs flinging. I mean, you got the two guys, good cop, bad cop. Yeah, the room's dark. Yeah, we get it. But change one thing. Change up the setting and go, it's not an interrogation there. It's an interrogation in a park. It's an interrogation in the ocean. It's an interrogation at an amusement park. It's an interrogation um, in a kitchen. 
And suddenly there's a fresh take on it. So you can do one little thing, even just changing up setting, and that will give it a fresh take. So again, I'm going to book smart to yeah, yeah. You know, have everybody like when you're watching it, look at the fresh take on certain things, certain scenes you thought you knew. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I was thinking of the, now, of course, my, my, my juices start flowing interrogation. So I'm like, well, what if one of the cops is like always eating? Like constantly while he's while he's talking to somebody, he's just eating and it's disgusting and you're focusing on what he's eating, but yet he's tearing this guy apart. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just throwing things out there, but right. it's just so, a new way of doing it. Right? What if the one of the cops is a clown instead? Dressed you dressed know? as a clown because he was undercover somewhere. We're writing right. something together. We need we need a co writer credit on this on the scene. <laughs> Um, now tell me a little bit about Coffee Break Screenwriter, which has been around for a couple years. Oh, you mean? Oh, that book. Yes. <laughs> yes. The Coffee Break Screenwriter. I want uh, you to, I want you to tell yeah. me, first of all, how can you write, how does a writer write a screenplay 10 minutes at a time? Well, kind of like if you look at the answers to the questions you've asked me, right? If you actually applied all those things that we just talked about, you could you could make progress in 10 minutes on a character. For example, let's say you wanted to go back to voice. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to do a pass on 10 pages, making sure that my character is now speaking his or her stage of life or profession. Okay, so I've now rewritten 10 pages just with that one technique that could take you 10 minutes of time. That could take you your coffee break time, Mm -hmm. you know? I think we spend this much time on like updating Facebook or tweeting something <laughs> fabulous or whatever, you know, when you could just go like, I'm just going to take, I'm going to do one thing to rewrite or make progress in, in, in the script and really you can do it. And I know you can do it because I do it in my classes. I make, make people like, I, I don't even give, give them 10 minutes. I give right. them, you know, isn't, isn't, I always tell people, uh, you know, I, I, this is one of the pieces of advice I always give people when they want to write screenplays. I'm like, just set up a goal of one page a day, you know, and in 90 days, you'll have a screenplay. If you, if you're feeling froggy, do two pages a day and you'll be done in 45 days. Right. Do three pages a day and you've done in a month and you've got a, you've got a first draft of a month. Right. In, in, in a month, you know, it's, and I've actually had people come back to me like, oh, Alex, thank God you told me to do that. I'm doing that now. Uh, and I'm like, but it's, it sounds so simple, but yet, it's not, and it could be a ten minute, do, 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 and you're done. Now, now, what will kill your ten minutes is when you go back in and you reread that page mm. first, mm. because <laughs> you reread it, you're going to go in and rewrite it. You're going to struggle over it, and then you're just done. when you're getting your second, day, like, oh, I I have to go back to work, you know, or back to my kid, you know, uh, or school. So, so yeah. Try and do these things knowing you will be able to go back in and make it all perfect, but don't try and get it perfect right away. Well, what are some of your suggestions for the dreaded rewriting process? Dreaded rewriting process. Um, It goes back to something that we talked about a little bit earlier, which is first lean into your own good idea. The first pass I have everybody do is making sure they're honoring their own log line because it is the common thing that I see with my own clients that they've backed away from it. And I kind of give them certain tools to, to sort of check in on certain areas, make sure that they're honoring at least sort of the two main hooks that come through in their log line at, at certain stages. Um, another thing is um, being, you know, if you have these sort of behaviors that come through, mm-hmm. these character rules, right? Um, turning up the dial um, in certain key scenes, making sure that those behaviors are constantly paying off um, for entertainment value or even breaking one of the rules to show change later mm-hmm. on. So instead of going back in and sort of redoing all of your characters, just turning up the dial on on who they are. Um, so so those are some tricks I would I would do for story and for character dialogue you could do one of the things that we talked about um for your ending this is where a lot of people have problems with the first draft is they they thought they could cheat the ending okay so yes somebody may have found the treasure but how did they do that 
make sure that there's a trigger moment. Like what was the event that triggered the solution to help you find the treasure? Go back in. If that scene is missing, that needs to be there. That's really important for your rewrite. Now, we've been talking a lot about craft uh, Mm -hmm. and and this, but I want to talk a little bit about business, about the business of screenwriting, because it's something that people don't talk about. And Mm -hmm. it's all wonderful when you have this perfect Oscar-winning screenplay in your hand, but if you don't understand how to pitch it, how to get it into the system, how the system works, you know, that's so – I see so many – I mean, I've read screenplays that I'm just like, how is this not produced? Like, how is this not made it? And and it also and I've read screenplays from you know million dollar screenwriters, and I'm and they just like here this is one of the thirty that I have in my drawer that I've never been able to get to produce and I'm like oh my god how is this not being produced? And he's <laughs> like I just can't. So it's tough for even established screenwriters, let alone for screenwriters coming in. So what advice do you have on the business side of it? And I know that's a very large com a very large question. So you know what yeah. area whatever areas you would like to discuss. <laughs> Well, you know, it's funny because that's not my area of expertise. Mine is, is all sort of in the in the writing and development stages. Mm-hmm. But um, from, you know, I'm going to, the first answer I'm going to give is going to be an eye roll answer because it is also about having a lot of content and really good content. And the reason I say this is because on my podcast, we've got, over 600 episodes. I try and have successful screenwriters and TV writers, and we're always going back to what was that moment that that triggered your big break? And it's completely random. It's oh, yeah. all random. Like there's never one answer. It could be, you know, uh, I was at this party and I'm a friend of a friend, and like we ended up bonding over skateboards, and then we found out that. I mean, it could just be random, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, or it could be that, you know, they tracked this one producer and they were able to really like get in the room and, and sell them on something. But when it all came down to it, it was when they had the opportunity, it was the content. So I would be remiss if I didn't say it's all about the content first. Um, but as far as what's going on in the industry right now, um, there's so many things that are happening because this um, agent WGA thing Mm -hmm. is actually creating new opportunities. Mm -hmm. You know, people always get creative when certain things are cut off. That's why like with the writer strike, right? We started seeing other platforms develop or independent producers rise back up and things like that. So um, I would say right now, you know, get on Twitter, look at what's happening in the writer's community. There are opportunities there that weren't there before. Another is, um, and don't be mad, but I do think that competitions have become the new vetting ground for managers and agents. They, sure. if, you, if you place or, or win a prestigious contest, they'll go, oh, I want to look at that material. But you as the writer have to vet some of these contests and make sure that you're not just throwing your competition money at willy nilly at things that are unproven or don't have industry connections at the end of it. So those are, that's some advice. Um, I, I hope that helps. Yeah, that, that is helpful. But and also, uh, you know, speaking to so many screenwriters, I'm sure as you have as well in your life, you realize that screenwriter, a professional screenwriter is the one that's not six years on one screenplay. Mm-hmm. You know, that is the biggest problem I see with so many young screenwriters. I'm like, hey, how's that screenwriter? How many, what have you done? I'm like, oh, I'm still on that screenplay. I almost got it. Almost got it. Almost cracked it. And it's five years later and they're still on that one screenplay where the professional screenwriter in that time has gotten 10, 15, 20 screenplays done and they're yeah. in their drawer. So when you do have that opportunity, like you were saying, that one script is not going to be it. They're going to go, uh, they might take that one or they might go, that's nice. It's a great example, but do you have anything else? And you should have three or four other samples or other projects waiting to go in a lot of ways. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and think of it this way. Um, if you sell your script to a large studio, you don't own it anymore. No. So why would you be married to that? You know, <laughs> your scripts, but don't marry them. Okay. Because somebody else is going to, is going to actually pay the money to marry that thing. You're going to have to give that bride away. You know, yeah. um, another thing is if you re- rewrite and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite, how open are you going to be to notes? You're going to be exhausted 
by the time somebody actually takes it and gives you notes. And then it becomes your job to do the notes. So and so, protective and protective of it too. Yes. So so my my advice is sorry, I'm No, there's I'm, a bird behind you. There's a bird behind you in the window, don't worry. That was yeah, it's, I see it in the background. It's all good. Oh, it's so cute. It's <laughs> <laughs> knocking. Um, uh, is is uh, is rewrite till it meets your own intentions. Mm-hmm. Okay, if you've rewritten and go, you know what? This is this is what I kind of had in my mind when I started, when it was mm-hmm. just in my brain, mm-hmm. and there it is on the page. You're done. Okay, time to send it out. If somebody wants to pay you to rewrite it. Awesome. You don't need to go around chasing notes. You've met your intention. That's awesome. (laughs) And do you have some big do's and don'ts when writing a screenplay? Um, do, uh, don't chase the market. Oh God. Yes. I'm going to start doing superhero movies because it's hot. Like, and by the time you're done, it's not right. Oh God. So yeah. So, so, uh, don't chase the market. Um, do these days, um, try and think why you're the best writer to tell this story. Actually, no, go the other way. Find a story where really you're the best writer for it. So this matches a little bit with your personal brand. You've probably heard other guests talk about this. Mm -hmm. The idea that, that, you know, Draw from something that's happened to you or some expertise you have. Don't turn up your nose at maybe even the job that you do. You know, um, like, for example, I had a, a client who was coming up with this courtroom thriller. And I was like, have you been in the courtroom? No. You know, are you a, are you a woman? No. You know, have you experienced sexism? No. It was like all about like sexism in the courtroom and all that. Like, <laughs> you know. And I was like, not that you're not allowed to write that, but it, the, the, the project didn't feel authentic. Right. And we got to the fact that at one point he was a logger in the seventies. Oh. Yeah. He was a lot. He was in, in, in his twenties. He was a hippie who had to uh, go into logging to support his family. And into that logging company came these ex cons that were hired from the local jail. Well, hello. I was like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so he wrote an original pilot around that. It was awesome. And guess what? It's he's really the person to write that. He's the only you person know? to write that. Yeah, yeah. Now, did it have to match verbatim his own experience? No, it was inspired by his own experiences. So you don't have to find something that that is like where you have to protect the rights of all the people around you. Mm-hmm. It's more the idea that you have some authority in this world. It feels authentic and it pitches really well that way you're connected to it. It's kind of like if Tarantino would do a Pixar movie, which I would go see, uh, but that's truly not on brand, is it? <laughs> well, but if he does, if he did a Pixar movie, Could you, you know, imagine, <laughs> you know, he's, he's, you know, king of certain genres, right? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. in a way, if you were going to animate a certain genre, he'd be the person to do it, you know, plus, you know, you know, what if he did something about, you know, a, a mouse, who worked in a video store and became an iconic filmmaker. Film director. Well, <laughs> it's okay, a bit on the nose. Great to a, tell. A bit, bit on the nose, bit on the nose, but yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, he'll do it, man. So, yeah, yeah. He'll, he'll do it. Um, and can you actually, you know, for, for everyone who's listening, because we have a lot of first time screenwriters who listen to this, can you just describe what on the nose is? Because that's a note that a lot of people get and they just don't get what that means. Can you just really quickly explain that? Well, I think that you, the, the way that you just sort of critiqued what I said with on the nose is I was being awfully literal, right? Yes. You know, it was like, well, that is definitely his story. Literally. It's not, it's not taking maybe an experience and nuancing it. Right. So that's one version of on the nose. But when we're talking about dialogue being on the nose, it's often when someone's speaking their thoughts or feelings out loud. So they're saying things like, Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm so angry right now. Right. I, I'm experiencing this this mixture of entertainment and embarrassment right now. I'm talking to you, Alex. Right. Like that kind of thing. Yeah. 
Yeah, and there is, and that is an epidemic as well. A lot of times, when with with first time writers as well, I did it when I started writing. I was writing right on the nose, and I would that was the note I would get back from studios when they would they would see my scripts and they would say it's on the nose, it's on the nose. And I'm like, what the hell is I had to look what on the nose meant? And I was like, oh, it's called about nuance, it's subtext, uh, you know, a look, you know, always show, don't tell uh, whenever you can. And it goes back to what you said about the audience has educated themselves in movies and TV. They're a really smart, savvy audience. So they get the context. All they have to see is that visual clue and they get it. A whole story is told. And now you have a new book coming that just it just came out a little while ago, right? Do you oh, have yeah. an- it's 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 a little thin. There you go, but <laughs> <laughs> I guess we could call it a book. It's called uh, Coffee Break Screenwriter Breaks the Rules. Okay. And it's all about, you know, you know those rules you all think you're supposed to follow because mm-hmm. of all those other books and stuff. <laughs> it, it sort of goes like, well, you know what? You should break those rules. But if you break those rules, here's why the rule's there to begin with. Mm-hmm. Here's how to break it creatively to actually make your script a little more original, right? Mm-hmm. But here's also how breaking that rule can break bad if you go too far with it. So it's it's looking at all those things. It should be educational and fun and gives you, uh, yeah, it gives you permission to to do something a little nuts. And when you said break bad, I just, Walter White just flew into my head. It was such a good show. <laughs> Everything revolves around Walter White. Obviously, obviously. Yeah. What's, what's, what's my name anyway? (laughs) So I'm going to ask you a few questions. I ask all of my guests, what Uh advice would you give a screenwriter wanting to break into the business today? Uh, (laughs) what advice would I give? Um, again, start with your own experiences. Look around you right now. Where are you? What can you mine from who you are and what you know? Okay. And now can you tell me a book that had the biggest impact on your life or career? Wow. Um, hmm. it, God, I wasn't prepared for these. Shoot, that's why, I, that's why I do that. Um, uh, as far as I, as far as Linda Aronson's um, uh, book, uh, God, what was it? Screenwriting reconstructed or oh my god okay got it we, 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 we'll look she it up about nonlinear screenwriting her first her first screenwriting book linda aronson mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. um i really respected the fact that she was trying to find patterns outside of conventional structure um oh screenwriting updated sorry okay. i'm getting as we okay. as established <laughs> So Linda Aronson screenwriting updated, you know, I really, really admired the effort to really dig in and find out why uh, uh, unconventional storytelling works. Got it. Now, what lesson took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? God, I guess I'm still learning it. You know what lesson took me the longest to learn is that I'm always learning, is mm. that that you are always learning on the job that you never know everything you are every day. There is something new to learn, you know, and so be open to it. So that's what I'm learning is that I'm still learning. Now, what was the biggest fear you had to overcome to achieve one of the biggest goals of your life? Oh gosh, people think because I have a podcast and (laughs) I feel you and I, uh, I teach publicly, you know, (laughs) Um, they think I must be a very sort of public showy person. Um, I really don't like social media. I don't Google myself. Um, every day is, uh, kind of, uh, some wrestling with the anxiety of how, how open everything is right now. It is um, there, are, open. there are advantages to it. There are disadvantages as well. And every day, I think you have to be a little bit brave if you want to communicate to a lot of people. So that's that's my my daily fear is is I don't know. <laughs> social it's, it's social media basically. It's, it's like, a little, I have a little bit of anxiety about it. I hate being on camera. I hate being on video. I hate it. But you, you know what? You've done fantastic. <laughs> 
You've done fantastic. <laughs> and I, I hope I've made it easy for you, but it's been fantastic having you on camera. You know, I, I think this is a, this is a, something that happens to podcasters because, you know, we, I've been podcasting for almost four years now on my two podcasts. And, you know, when you're, you base, I do it basically alone in, in a room with a mic, or I'm doing it like this over a Skype call with somebody. And, you know, it's very different than being out like a YouTuber, right. like, you know, like getting out there and like, okay, guys, we're going to go do this. Like, I'm not that dude either. I, a lot of people think that I'm very, and I am to a certain extent, but I'm, I, I, I'm happy at home. I don't need to be out at a club somewhere. Right. <laughs> those, exactly. those, those days are gone for me. I'm good. I'm very happy about that. <laughs> the introverted extrovert, right? I think that's the introverted extrovert. Those, ca- those categories. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's the extrovert who enjoys being an introvert. <laughs> right. Can't wait to go back to, to their introverted life. Oh, exactly. yeah. I'll, I'm going to just veg at home with my wife and watch Netflix tonight. I don't need to go out party anywhere. Um, and now, the toughest question of all. Mm-hmm. Three of your favorite films of all time. Oh, um, Paper Moon. Oh, I love movie. Paper Moon. Yeah, good movie. Uh, it's one that I can watch over and over again. Um, and you're gonna you're gonna laugh at me. On it's the okay. Next one. I've heard it because all on the show. It's such a script writing teacher thing to say, but um, Citizen Kane. No, okay. Is yeah, it's been on the show. Fantastic yeah. movie. I really, really love. You know, it's it's different points of view. Um, I was one of those people that was like, what? That was Rosebud? Like that was Rosebud. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Hello. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I thought you were going to, I thought you were going to say Chinatown. Nah, no, yeah. I'm really, no, mm, you know, I, I'm not in love with Chinatown. Don't tell anybody, you know, okay. but, um, and then, uh, um, gosh, I, I, again, I always go with sort of like the, my, my, latest boyfriend and, and my latest boyfriend, I keep going back to book smart. Yeah. I just really, I was so happy about that movie for so many reasons. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. So I would say those three movies off the top of my head. Cool. And now where can people find you and your work? Uh, I'm on the page.tv. That is my website for classes. I love it when people show up in classes. Mm-hmm. And now I'm also doing online video classes. Again, trying not to be afraid of the camera so that I can um, actually uh, teach in real time to people all over. So check that out in the books there and links to the podcast and all that kind of stuff. Awesome. Pilar, it has been an absolute pleasure. I'm so glad we finally got to do this. It was great talking to you. Thank you so much for dropping some major, major knowledge bombs today on The Tribe. I appreciate it. I really appreciate you inviting me and for being so patient with the scheduling. Thank you so much, Alex. I want to thank Pilar for coming on and dropping those knowledge bombs on The Tribe today. Thank you so much, Pilar. It was an absolute pleasure having you on the show. She is a wealth, a wealth of information, and I will put links to everything she has, her website, her podcast, her books, uh, her courses and workshops, everything I'll put in the show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash BPS051. And if you haven't already, guys, please head over to ScreenwritingPodcast.com, subscribe, and leave a good review for the show. It really helps the show out a lot. Thank you for everyone who has done that. Thank you for all the support. And for all the bulletproof screenwriting true believers, before the year is out, there might be a small surprise for you. That's all I'm going to say. You know I love doing this. You know I love just dropping little nuggets, little hints of things that I'm working on. And uh, I am going to be uh, just, you know, just a nice surprise for all of the Bulletproof Screenwriting tribe. So thank you guys again so much for everything. As always, keep on writing no matter what. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast at BulletproofScreenwriting.tv. You know the right way to get a great outdoor space is to do it yourself. Lowe's is here to help with savings on everything you need to get started. Step up your space with a new patio or walkway and get square patio stones now 10 for $10. And freshen up your deck with a new coat of stain and get Valspar exterior stain and sealant starting at just $36.98. Whatever's on your to-do list this summer, do it right for less. Start with Lowe's. Stone offer valid through 814 excludes Alaska and Hawaii, U.S. only.